Thank you everyone who has joined us tonight for this discussion with the folks from Access BC. First, I want to acknowledge that I am coming from the ancestral traditional territories and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nation. My name is Ian Bushfield and I'm the Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association. Tonight you'll hear from Marissa Levesque and Emily Weisenthal, who are volunteers with the Access BC campaign. Marissa and Emily are both medical students at UBC's Southern Medical Program in Kelowna. As well, the co-founder of the Access, B Access BC campaign, Dr. Teal Phelps Bonderoff, our own, uh, is here on hand to answer any additional questions that might come up as well. For those who aren't familiar with humanism, it's an ethical worldview that promotes human rights, personal liberty, and social responsibility. In the second Humanist Manifesto, which was published in 1973, it called for, quote, the right to birth control, abortion, and divorce, among many other things to be recognized. One of its signatories was Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. Uh, at this time, in the 70s, he was opening abortion, illegal abortion clinics across Canada, you know, getting arrested and demanding that this was a legitimate purpose. So it's good to see that the you know, activist spirit is continuing on in the fight for reproductive justice. Humanists have a long and deep history of supporting reproductive rights, which continues today with the BCHA being an official organizational endorser of the Access BC campaign. Before we begin, though, a couple more housekeeping notes. First, I've muted everyone's microphones on entry just out of respect to everyone listening. I do ask you to keep them muted, except at the end when we'll have some time for questions, and then either myself or Teal will uh, recognize you and we'll take turns politely as we do in society. We are also recording tonight's talk to share it later on our YouTube channel and podcast. So do be in mind that if you don't want to have your comments recorded, either say so before you say them or perhaps just share them in the chat. And finally, as a small charity, we rely entirely on donations to make this work and these events possible, as does the Access BC campaign. For us at the BCHA, it's our time for our year-end fundraising drive, so please consider making a tax-deductible donation at bchumanist.ca or considering joining the association to help us reach our goal of doubling our membership in the next year. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emily, I believe, who will take us into the talk. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name's Emily. Um, I'm a third-year medical student at UBC, and I'm here to talk to you about reproductive justice, health equity, and the cam campaign for no-cost contraception in BC. Um, we're all here giving this talk because we believe contraception should be free for all, and we're going to spend um, the next little while telling you why and sharing some evidence with you. Um, so as I said, my name is Emily, and I'm joined tonight by um, my colleagues Marissa and Teal, um, who will both be um, speaking a little later. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that these slides were made by Dr. Ruth Habte, who is an Access BC volunteer and an OBGYN resident at UBC. Um, these slides were first created for a presentation ahead of World Contraception Day on September 26th. Um, so Marissa and I are presenting from Silix territory or the territory of the Okanagan Nation and Teal is joining us from uh, the Wasanich and Lekwungen speaking peoples territory. Um, and before we begin, I just want to encourage everyone to take a moment to acknowledge and learn about um, the people whose territories you are occupying and joining us from today. And especially when we're talking about um, reproductive justice, the role that colonialism, ha colonialism has played and continues to play um, in um, harming and oppressing um, folks on these territories. Uh, so on that note, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, we are white settlers and uninvited guests on this land, and we don't necessarily have lived experience in all of the barriers to health access that we're going to be chatting about today. We're going to do our best to speak to the available research, but recognize that we are not experts in everything that we're talking about. Um, we're going to share the work of some individuals and groups who are experts and encourage you to read more about um, these topics if they're new to you. And we also encourage you to trust that people are the experts of their own bodies, um, which is something we really believe fiercely here at Access BC. Um, for example, there's a campaign called the Inclusive Contraception Campaign. That's something UBC med students have started um, that Access BC has been involved in. 
um, which is gathering stories from people with lived experience around barriers to healthcare access and contraception specifically. Um, so this is just a little outline of the road we're going to travel together. Um, we're going to chat about what is health equity and what is reproductive justice, why we believe contraception should be free, uh, how Access BC was started and the role um, that we've played in kind of making contraception a, a big topic of conversation in the BC political scene, which is something I think we're all really proud of, um, our letter writing campaign and then our social media work. Uh, okay, so first off, health equity and how it relates to free contraception for all. So here is a quote from our campaign member, Ruth. Um, she shared this back when she was a medical student. It was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, I believe. Um, and this is making reference to the fact that the basis of health equity is that different individuals facing different barriers may need different levels of support um, and may be afforded greater means to reach the same outcomes as those coming from a place of greater privilege. Um, so that's kind of like an initial definition. Um, and this is from the World Health Organization, which defines health equity as the absence of unfair and unavoidable or remediable differences in health among population groups defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically. So when we're talking about health equity and um, we'll use Fair Pharmacare as an example. So consider the number of things someone has to do to even qualify for Fair Pharmacare. Um, it requires someone to have MSP, to have filed their taxes, to apply while waiting. Um, folks that often have to pay out of pocket. There's deductibles that are set on income and people need to meet the deductible before 70% of the coverage goes to this or that. Several meds are not covered like certain OCPs and um, different contraceptives are indicated for different people for different re reasons. Um, for example, Nexplanon, which may be the best option for certain people um, for a variety of reasons is not covered. Um, teens who may come from like higher economic um, status households and have not met criteria, but they as individuals do not have the means to access contraception um, and access and contraception through their parents um, violates their confidentiality. Um, and it's an effective way for them. So why advocate for free contraception for all? People should not have to pass a means test or justify their choice to the government to access reproductive health care. Um, these are a few photos from our World Contraception Day 2021 campaign, uh, which I believe Marissa will chat more about um, later on in our talk. Um, yeah, but we believe fiercely that people, um, all people with a uterus should be eligible for free contraception. So reproductive justice, this is a very uh, large and complicated topic. Um, we're just gonna skim the surface of it today, but just talk about how um, it is foundational to the work that we do. So before we begin, uh, we just wanna touch on this topic called intersectionality and you can't talk about reproductive justice without talking about intersectionality. And this was a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is an incredible uh, Harvard educated lawyer and black feminist scholar who initially coined the term and published on the topic in 1989. Um, and this is uh, just a reference to her work, Demarginalize, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex. Um, so, we have a quote from uh, Kimberly Crenshaw here. The problems of exclusion cannot be solved simply by including black women within an already established analytical structure because the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism. Any analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular manner in which black women are subordinated. Um, this concept kind of emerged in the context um, of several lawsuit actions that weren't certified because it could not be proven that there was both racism and sexism at play. Um, so the, uh, in 
her talk, she references an example of an auto shop not employing black women despite employing white women and black men. Um, and it was hard to prove discrimination in that case. So intersectionality refers to the fact that we all occupy different intersecting identities um, and that those identities um, impact our position of power and privilege and oppression in different ways all at once. Um, so intersectionality is basically a lens, a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of an inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. So it's important to understand that different forms of inequality that impact folks of different identities, be that uh, folks living in poverty, folks of different abilities, um, Black, Indigenous people of color, LGBTQ folks, um, these experiences exacerbate one another um, and the experience of discrimination is greater than the sum of the individual parts. So, why is it important to remember intersectionality and what does that look like uh, on the ground and in policy? Um, so this slide is in reference to um, an act that was proposed in 1993 under the Clinton administration, uh, the Health Security Act, which um, a group of women of African descent in the US felt did not address reproductive issues that disproportionately harmed black women. Um, such as poverty and intimate partner violence, infant mortality and morbidity, environmental issues, HIV and AIDS. Um, they felt that these issues weren't adequately addressed in this act that was purporting to be um, universally beneficial for women. Um, and this group of uh, Black feminist activists recognized that the mostly middle class white women leading the re reproductive rights movement at this time uh, could not represent the needs of all women and did not represent the experience of um, being both black and a woman. So this group of badass ladies um, bought a full page ad in the Washington Post and roll call that featured over 800 signatures calling for any healthcare reform package to include the concerns of black women um, and, that, and, and access to comprehensive healthcare services that were accessible and appropriate and relevant um, to them. So get yourself a framework that can do both. Um, the ideal framework to consider uh, reproductive rights issues is a combination of reproductive rights and the right to do things with your own body, but also access and community that is structured around um, social justice and equity work. So three years later, after this initial uh, debacle, um, 16 organizations, including um, Black, Asian American, Latina, Indigenous women, got together to create Sister Song. And Sister Song is a really rad collective uh, devoted to the reproductive and sexual health of women and gender non-conforming people of color that's based in Atlanta in the United States. Um, and their current executive director gives a number of really great talks. So this is just a screenshot of one of them um, <laughs> included. Um, but here we have a quote, overall reproductive justice is about the human right to self-determine. Um, Loretta Ross, who's a, also a scholar on this topic was involved with Sister Song and has also written a really wonderful book on the topic that I would recommend. Um, and next, this graphic right here referring to the difference between reproductive rights versus reproductive justice. So these are both terms that are kind of um, used interchangeably a lot of the time, and I've probably done so in this, in this talk, um, but actually reference quite different things. So reproductive rights are, are, are important and um, are based more in law, but have a narrower scope. And we're born, the concept was kind of born more out of um, a second wave feminist movement started mainly by middle-class white women. Um, and reproductive justice in turn is an approach is, that's more intersectional, focusing on um, how race, gender, ability, class um, inform and drive reproductive rights and the impact that they have on controlling our bodies and include, includes parenting rights, um, rights to um, around abortion and healthcare and reproductive health in a more expansive way. Um, so we want communities to be healthy and to be able to raise children 
um, if and when they see fit. Um, so this is a really powerful quote from the former, former ED of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, who is now a member of the New York State Assembly. Reproductive justice recognizes that legal rights do not always translate to meaningful access. It centers the experiences of the marginalized immigrants, people of color, queer and trans folks, youth and low income communities. So unlike reproductive rights, a tenant of reproductive justice is being able to, or is folks being able to parent uh, their children in safe environments and be supported in their parenting decisions, including having as many or as few children or none as you want. Um, for example, indigenous folks in Canada, um, there is a long history that has continued into the, into the present um, of indig indigenous uh, women being forcibly sterilized and having their children stolen from them. And this um, practice continues in, in different ways in, um, in modern colonial institutions. Um, and this framework is mostly used to describe black women in the US, but it can also expand to issues um, surrounding indigenous folks in Canada. So a couple of kind of case studies of reproductive justice in action. Um, the first example we want to chat about is the Texas abortion laws, which is a very timely um, bit of awfulness. Uh, a very restrictive abortion law that was just enacted, Senate Bill 8, uh, is a law that limits abortion care in Texas beyond six weeks of pregnancy, sometimes even earlier. And this is very focused on law, but it is an issue, issue of reproductive rights. So there's been a lot of talk, a lot of media commentary, a lot of really rad activism in response to this bill, but looking at what Texas was like prior to the enactment of this law, what was the climate around abortion and contraception access, we can see that this issue and these attitudes have existed and were enshrined in different ways um, before the enactment of this bill. Um, restrictions, there was restrictions on minors accessing abortion, um, a lot of commentary and weight given to the pro-birth movement. Um, there's very few abortion centers, especially in rural and low-income settings, and there are very limited social supports for folks wanting contraception or wanting support around parenting. Um, one of the groups working to improve reproductive justice before the recent law change is the FBS Center working in North Texas. They're the only reprodu reproductive justice group in North Texas, and they were founded to bring attention to the disproportionate rates of HIV among um, Black women and people of color in the state. And they have programs related to HIV, abortion access, and maternal mortality. So looking at our own province here in BC, um, from a reproductive rights point of view, contraception has never legally been free to everyone in BC. Um, it's still very difficult to access. So from an access point of view, there's still many issues for folks living in Northern communities, in rural, remote indigenous communities with limited access to physicians and nurse practitioners, folks with limited access to pharmacies, um, folks with limited access to providers who are willing to prescribe contraception. So even if contraception becomes free for all in BC, as we are all working hard uh, to make happen, um, there's still lots of, lots of work to be done on the reproductive justice side of things to ensure that access, um, that access piece is there. Okay, Marissa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Emily. Um, that was fantastic. So I'm just going to take over and talk a little bit about some of the research around um, what happens when you make contraception free. So um, there are a number of countries in the world, primarily in Europe, where there is already um, subsidies for universal access to contraception, either in full or in part. Um, and these include the UK, France, Spain, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Italy, and Ireland. 
Um, this is, of course, not an exhaustive list, but some of the sort of longstanding countries who've been at the forefront of um, improving contraception access. And so cost is something that impacts contraception options, um, which people have access to, and it remains a critical barrier um, in a lot of countries. And obviously it's one of the main things that we're here to talk about today. And it's um, sort of at the tenant of Access BC is uh, removing this barrier of cost. And so going back to the reproductive justice approach, the issue of cost is exacerbated by all of these additional factors such as uh, new immigrants who may not know how the healthcare system works or how to access it, um, folks coming from a lower socioeconomic background who may not be able to pay out of pocket for contraception while they wait for their enrollment or their um, payout from Fair Pharmacare, uh, young folks who don't have private coverage apart from their parents and accessing contraception through their parents' um, insurance may not be an option for everybody, may not be something that they're ready to talk about or something that they would be well received. And then folks from small rural northern indigenous communities, as Emily mentioned, um, there may not even be healthcare providers uh, nearby who are able to prescribe them contraception, there may not be pharmacies nearby. So there are a lot of uh, exacerbating issues, but um, cost remains one of the main uh, issues for contraception access in BC. So looking at the research, um, one of the fantastic um, research teams that does a lot of research in this area is uh, the contraception and abortion, abortion research team at UBC, and there's their little infographic at the bottom. Um, it's a good place to look for current research on this topic. Um, but one of the trends that has come out of recent research is that Canadians are tending to use less effective forms of birth control. Um, and in particular, folks from lower socioeconomic groups um, are even more likely to use things like injectable contraception, uh, which would be the Depot Provera, which has a lower upfront cost than um, some of the longer acting forms like IUDs or implants, but may not be the best option for all folks um, or condoms, which we know are, are less effective than a lot of the long acting contraceptions. Um, and these, it's just easier to pay for these. We don't have the upfront money to, to put towards the more expensive forms of contraception, even though they may not be the best options. Sorry about that. So looking at one particular study, it's just called the CHOICE study, the contraceptive CHOICE study uh, done at Washington University in St. Louis. This provided uh, just over 1,400 teens with no cost contraception, as well as education about the effectiveness of long acting birth control methods, um, enrolling teens from the years of 2008 to 2013. Um, and at the end of the study, and after they received that standard contraceptive counseling, they were given their choice of contraception uh, for free. And 72% of them chose a long acting reversible contraceptive, which is the IUDs and the implants. And what they found was that um, compared to um, all US teens, folks who were enrolled in this study and were given free contraception had a reduced teen pregnancy rate, as well as reduced teen birth and abortion rates. So that speaks for itself. A uh, second study out of Finland um, provided free contraception to teens, as well as or eliminating the age limit on access to emergency contraception. Um, so that would be some of the pills you can get from the pharmacy um, that are used as emergency contraception. And they also found that uh, teens who were provided with free of charge contraception um, compared to all comers had lower rates of teen pregnancy and abortion. Um, so as you can see, a lot of these studies do focus on teens, um, but they are applicable to the general population. So the Colorado Family Planning Initiative was a $28 million grant that provided just over uh, almost 44,000 IUDs free of charge to folks in Colorado. And um, similarly to the other studies, um, folks who received free contraception compared to the general population, we saw reduced adolescent births, um, reduced teen pregnancies by over half, reduced teen abortion rates by over 60%, and also saved over $70 million in public assistance costs. So 
um, you can imagine there are a lot of both direct and long-term costs associated with unplanned pregnancies, particularly in young folks. So ultimately, if uh, teens get pregnant, uh, then they require some social assistance, especially in the US where not everyone has uh, excellent access to free healthcare, um, both to birth their baby and as well as afterwards um, in terms of social assistance. So there are a lot of both direct costs and long term costs um, that are associated with unplanned pregnancies in particular in young folks. And then after this initial study was released, um, the teens from the original study were followed and it was shown that there was a significant increase in the teens being able to finish high school if they were a, a part of this original study where they re received free contraception. And so one of the quotes uh, that Ruth included was from local staff at uh, the CFPI clinic, the Colorado Family Planning Initiative Clinic. Um, that really resonated with our group. Um, so do you know how, do you realize how much money is being saved in welfare alone by preventing early and unwanted pregnancies? It boggles my mind. Uh, and I think that really speaks to it just making logical sense. It really does. Um, and so focusing on Canada, um, every year in Canada, there are over 187,000 unintended pregnancies. And the direct cost of these unintended pregnancies is $320 million. Um, and it's reported that the majority of the co this cost comes from imperfect contraception use. So uh, less effective methods like condoms uh, are frequently uh, used imperfectly. It's just the nature of, of those forms of contraception, but they are the most cost effective upfront. And it's estimated that um, there will be $34 million in, um, in savings in Canada every year with increased access to long acting reversible contraceptives. So with the IUDs and the implants, uh, there is no such thing as imperfect use. Um, their effectiveness is, is um, very, very high and there's no sort of room for user error. But again, these are the most uh, expensive forms of contraception up front. And looking specifically at Canadian adolescents, um, Canadian ad adolescents have over 39,000 unimpreg unintended pregnancies every year, uh, the direct cost of these being over $60 million. And um, again, over half of these costs are from being unable to follow a contraceptive regimen, such as taking a birth control pill every day. So increasing the uptake of these long acting reversible contraceptives could save the government over $3 million every year. And then some BC specific data. Um, this was published in 2010, a study by Options for Sexual Health. Um, it is currently the best data that we have that's been published, um, the most recent. So this estimated that every dollar that's spent on contraception by the government could save them as much as $90 uh, in public expenditure on social supports. Um, and that the BC government could save as much as $95 million annually. Um, it would cost, they estimated it would cost about $60 million upfront to implement this plan, um, but overall the savings um, would be much greater than that. All right, so changing lanes a little bit after talking about some of the research about why we do what we do uh, to who we are. So Access BC um, was founded back in the beginning of 2017 um, by Dr. Teal Phelps Bondaroff and Devin Black, um, who are the center two folks in this lovely picture here, um, with the primary goal of the campaign being uh, simple enough, it sounds, to make all prescription contraception free in British Columbia. So the roots of the campaign were really to start with um, conducting research, putting together a briefing paper, meeting with MLAs and ministerial staff, doing outreach, which you can see in this picture here back in pre-COVID times uh, when we didn't have to wear masks everywhere, and then con consulting with governments on different levels um, to gain support for the campaign. Um, and again, all with the goal of making contraception free in BC. So one of the major tenets of our campaign is the letter writing campaign. So, um, I wouldn't know the exact number, we can ask Teal at the end how many we've sent in uh, at the moment, but thousands of folks uh, have written more than 10,000 letters to MLAs in BC in support of uh, the campaign. 
This photo is from back uh, when things were paper, but we have since switched to an online platform, um, which essentially auto fills um, your name and contact information into a pre-filled letter and sends it to uh, a number of MLAs at a time, or you're able to write your own letter and it automatically sends it out um, to the, the folks that we want to, to reach. Um, looks a little bit like this. And we support everyone in uh, joining our letter writing campaign because it takes about two minutes. Um, so currently what we're doing is sending letters to five MLAs at a time uh, and then switching that every two weeks. So we're um, trying to have sort of a wide set of MLAs who are receiving a whole lot of our letters at once, getting it sort of at the front of their minds and hoping that they'll um, you know, approach the, the government with our ideas. So I have the link posted here. I encourage everyone to click on it, save it for later. Um, if you want some Access BC buttons, keep for you and your friends. Uh, the first few people who, um, who send us a screenshot of after you've sent in your letter, would um, we're happy to send you some buttons. Um, make sure you share it with your friends as well. And lastly, just talking about um, some of the newer tenants of our campaign, which is focusing a little bit more on social media. Um, and so Emily and I are part of our social media team, as well as Dr. Ruth Habte, who these slides came from, and a few other uh, members of our team. Um, so some of the things that we do on social media, uh, one is we help with our fundraising campaigns. So as was mentioned at the beginning, we are another entirely volunteer-run campaign. Um, and we need funding for the letter writing software um, and ensuring that MLAs are getting sort of our amplified messages, sending printed letters. So we use our social media uh, to help um, push forward those fundraising campaigns. Um, we also do some amplification of our allies and um, focusing on some really important international days. So we did a campaign for World Contraception Day, which was on October 26th. Um, the idea for this campaign was borrowed from uh, a similar campaign in Ontario called Cover Contraception, um, where campaign supporters took photos explaining why free contraception was important to them and posted them on social media with uh, the hashtags, um, hashtag WC2021 and Access BC so that we could amplify their messages. Um, we reposted these tagging um, the Premier, the Health Minister, and some relevant MLAs. Um, and so the photos looked a little bit like this and uh, we got quite a few supporters. This is just a, a handful of folks who sent in their messages, um, which was really empowering to see. And um, we got a, a fair amount of, of media coverage for this as well. Oops, sorry, I'm switching the wrong slide here. Right. And then uh, something that we're doing right now, we're currently in uh, coming towards the end of the 16 days of activism against gender based violence, um, which is a UN women worldwide campaign which runs from uh, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women on November 25th until Human Rights Day on December 10th. So we are really taking this opportunity to amplify some of the voices of our allies who are involved in gender equity activism. Um, and of course, improving access to contraception um, and allowing all folks with uteruses to make decisions about their bodies is uh, one of the major tenets of um, gender equity. And so I just posted our social media again here. Um, we've got Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, which we um, often share research on as well, if you're interested um, and try to make some of the bigger research papers nice and succinct and share those uh, in digestible bites. So if you're interested in some of the up-to-date research on contraception, um, these are some of the places that we share. Um, lastly, just a, a thank you again to Dr. Habte for these slides. Um, our co-founders, Dr. Teal Phelps Bonneroff and Devin Black, uh, Kennedy, who does uh, a lot of the administrative work for Access BC, and Dr. Sarah Mallison, who's another member of our social media team. Uh, and that's all that we have for you. So I'm going to pass it over to Teal and Ian to uh, bounce any questions off of.
Well, I'll just maybe jump in while Ian's looking for his mute button and people are, are thinking of questions. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. It's excellent. And, uh, and we'll do the teacher thing where we stare into the screen while people uh, come up with questions. I did want to answer the one question you asked, which was how many letters have we had sent in? So we've been running a letter writing campaign for a couple of years now, and we've had four or five different waves. So the math is complicated, but we've, we've done well over 20,000 letters at this point. Um, and, and there's probably many more. Um, every time you go to the website and it only takes 30 seconds, two minutes, depending how long you, uh, if you want to skim read the letter, um, that goes to five MLAs. So people, one, one effort, one click goes, becomes five letters. I actually just did it. Um, we updated our email, our MLA email list yesterday um, or Friday rather. And uh, just a couple other uh, updates on the campaign. We met with uh, parliamentary secretary for gender equity, uh, Grace Lore yesterday, myself and a couple of our team members um, to, to talk to her about the issue. And where we're currently at in the campaign is the, the BC NDP, BC Liberals and BC Greens all endorse universal contraception in the last election. And the BC NDP is in the majority government right now. So it's it's in their, their, their proposals. And it was in the Minister of Health's mandate letter. So Minister Dix had free contraception on his mandate letter, a very clear line, which means it's going to happen. But it's not happening right away. Um, so we've since since that announcement happened, it's been a few years, and we've been waiting for an announcement um, and for it to be included in the budget. Um, one other number, you know, it's going to cost the province give or take sixty million dollars to roll out the policy, but it will pay for itself within a year. And as we've seen from the amazing numbers from the presentation, it starts saving money like right away. But there's an initial cost which needs to be made into the budget. So we're really hoping to make it uh, into the 2022 budget, which should be announced um, in the late winter, early spring, um, because this policy needs to be done right away. The big situation I find very frustrating is it's a great policy. As we saw, it saves money, improves equity, improves health outcomes. Um, and so every every week that we every month that we wait is a month that people don't have access to contraception. I mean, as we've heard, too, like we're not these are intersectional issues and there are what we call compounding barriers. And so, you know, cost is one barrier. But there's so many other barriers. There's taboo, there's education, there's you know people living in remote communities where transportation is an issue, time off work. Um, a lot of people don't realize that to go get a prescription, you have to take time off work, get childcare for existing children, take time off school, and then take even more time off to say, get an IUD inserted. These things all add up and they, they fall disproportionately on people who can't get pregnant. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to look forward to doing in addition to getting our really important policy in the budget and seeing that it's implemented, um, there's two additional things. Um, one is making sure that the government policy covers as expansive a range of contraception as possible. Uh, as we've seen, like uh, the example from Colorado, I love because it was just so successful and the, the evidence shows that free contraception works so well, um, but that was just copper IUDs. And it's not, when it comes to contraception, it's never one size fits all. Those work for some folks, they don't work for others. Um, and so we really want to make sure that the government's policy is as expansive as possible and in, including new emerging contraceptives that come out. Um, so we've been talking a lot about contraceptives for people with uteruses and who can get pregnant. But when contraceptives emerge for people with testes and um, who can impregnate other people, we want those covered too. Um, and there's been some really interesting science on those, but they've been delayed for uh, poor reasons often um, and and people complaining about really minor side effects and that's a conversation for another day um, and, and a couple other things I just wanted to highlight is um, our allies and sister campaigns we're just hearing at, at the end how we have a sister campaign in Ontario that's been set up there's a sister campaign in Manitoba um, and we're hoping to see groups spread across the country so for folks who are watching this on YouTube and if your province, state, or other jurisdiction doesn't have free contraception, go to our website and there's tons of materials there where you can learn and reach out to us. We're happy to share our resources with you. And a couple other last points would be, you know, one, once this is in, our, in the provincial budget and implemented, it's not done. We have to deal with other barriers. I don't know about um, the rest of you, but I've been very worried about what's going on in America right now. Um, we've got, you know, rolling back of, of fundamental freedoms of reproductive health. And a lot of times we feel really impotent in the face of that kind of, you know, re repressive misogynistic wall of, of doom. Um, and so one of the hopes that I have for British Columbia is we can be sort of a beacon, um, you know, a hero who's starting to smash the patriarchy in North America. We would be the first jurisdiction to really, you know, to do this kind of a policy at the, at the provincial level. So I really hope that BC like goes first, does this right away so we can really be a beacon to kind of offer hope to folks uh, in, in a time when it's getting pretty dark and especially in America land. And I think I might just leave, oh, I will actually note a couple other things. So 
we have an amazing team of volunteers. We have 75 volunteers spread out across the province. We were just talking at the beginning of the talk how so many of our volunteers are like medical students or doctors and people with very busy lives. So if you have some spare time and you want to write some letters and or get a bit more involved in the campaign, please get in touch because our team is a bunch of very hardworking people. And it's amazing to work with the people because we have diverse folks from all walks of life, lawyers, doctors, artists, retired health practitioners. And, and I will also say that in addition to the support we've had from groups like the BZ Humanists and a wide range of, of groups ranging from doula collectives to provincial wide um, unions like the BC Federation of Labor, uh, we've also been endorsed by 29 districts and municipalities. Um, and you can look at the list on our website. And if your municipality hasn't stepped up uh, and spent five minutes passing a motion to support universal contraception, you should write to your city councillors. That that's very disappointing. Um, and they can spend five minutes to take a chip at the a chip away at the, the ankles of the patriarchy. Um, so we'd encourage you to get in touch and we're happy to write those motions for you and help you through the process. Uh, one of the great things about this campaign is we've taken a lot of people who hadn't done a lot of reproductive justice activism and given them the tools uh, the, the team has come together and shared tools and developed each other's skills to the point where we now have a campaign that's been running for four years with a huge team and our amazing social media people. And we've been doing government consultations and we're like a stakeholder. So we've been at like formal government consultations on, on sexual and reproductive health, which is a long way to go from just being a Twitter account four years ago and at this kitchen table here. So that was kind of a, just a couple of things I wanted to add is that I do the nuts and bolts and some of the strategy part of the campaign and happy to answer questions there. And I know that uh, Emily and Marissa are happy to answer some, probably any of the questions as well. So do we have any questions from our, our audience? I saw one in the chat asking if you're happy to share the slides. Like I said, we will post the video online, but if you're happy to share the slides, you can just send them to me and I'll forward them to everyone who RSVP'd. That sounds good. Yeah, we'll make sure you get them. I was gonna ask you, Teal, to talk about some of your wins, but you already talked about that in terms of the budget and, or well, not the budget, but at least the campaign promises. Hmm. One of the questions, I have while we wait for anyone else if they have them. Um, like I, my experience with contraceptives is the privileged man who just has to buy condoms awkwardly every so often. So I know what those cost, but what what does an IUD cost if you don't have like private healthcare covering it? What does it actually cost out of pocket? I, I, I'll defer to Emily and Marissa on this one, but I'm happy to answer. I'll, I can jump in here because it's, it's, it really depends on the type of IUD. So a copper IUD could be 70 to $80, um, but the hormonal IUDs can be up to $380, $400. That's the direct cost of the IUD. Um, the implant, the price has gone down. Uh, so for folks who are not familiar, there's also a contraceptive implant. It's a little stick that goes in your arm. Um, and uh, the first time my partner and I used one of those, it was priced at like $600. This is, this is a while back in the UK when it wasn't available in Canada. Um, but now I think it's gone down to under a hundred dollars. Um, but it really depends where you go, right? The pill is $20 for a pack. Um, but as, as we've heard, those are also more prone to, to potentially being lost or being used less consistently. Marissa, go ahead. I think you wanted to jump in here too. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to also point out even folks who have access to, um, insurance through their work, um, or school, whatever it may be, often, uh, IUDs are not covered for the purpose of contraception. They are often only covered for the purpose of say, um, like heavy menstrual bleeding, um, some of their more medical, um, medical, uh, uses rather than contraception. Um, and as well, often with the oral contraceptive pills, there are, so TL sort of quoted $20 a month, and that's often true for so your sort of generic forms, um, which again, often don't work for many folks. The side effect profiles are very different. Um, and sometimes, uh, and if you do have to pay for, say, the, the name brand, those can cost much, much more per month, um, like $60 or so for, for a month's supply. Um, and then I think Emily mentioned in her part of the presentation that some of the forms that are the most effective for folks, what they have a lower um, amount of hormone, maybe fewer side effects, or some of the ones that you can take um, uninterrupted instead of having a break every month are not even covered under pharmacare. And actually, just to build on what Marissa was saying, um, some kinds, some copper IUDs are also classified as medical devices, so they're not covered under under 
you know, health plans. Um, and it's also worth noting that, you know, there's been other solutions proposed to issues around barriers to contraception. And one of those is removing the need for prescriptions for some contra you know, contraceptives, right? Uh, many jurisdictions have done this and we definitely support this, but want to make sure that it happens after it's free. Because otherwise the situation you get is people have health coverage under maybe their work plan or their parents' plan that covers prescription contraception or prescription drugs. And if you remove the prescription element and it's over the counter, that makes it easier to physically access, but now you have to pay for it. Um, so there's all these kind of unintended consequences and things that have to happen first. Um, and so that's 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 one of those aspects. Um, and I will note, like whenever we write to politicians, we get responses that are like, well, we have fair pharma care in British Columbia. And we've already kind of saw that in the presentation, how that's often sort of pawned off as, oh, this works for folks. But to qualify for fair pharma care, you have to have a very low income. Um, and to the point where I, you could not live in you know in housing in Victoria in Vancouver or Victoria given the price of housing um, and then they have you know oh there's a you know, deductible of a hundred dollars that's a lot of money for some folks especially given the income brackets for which they they qualify um, and again this is we live in Canada and, and it doesn't matter where you live you know you shouldn't have to pay for these kinds of fundamental choices to make fundamental choices about what happens to your body um, and then the other one I think is worth highlighting and this was already kind of brought up in the presentation but I think I'd like to underscore it is the issue of privacy. Um, so I think Emily mentioned this, um, which were basically, you know, young people like, oh, they have it covered under their parents' plan or, you know, it's easy, you have a deductible, but now they have to give up their privacy and let their parents know that they're on contraception, which might work for some folks, but in other people, it could actually put their housing and personal safety at risk. Um, and that's unfortunately the case. And, and so people have to make that choice of, do I have access, con do I access contraception and hope my parents don't find out? Um, or, you know, or, or how do they find the money? Um, and so that's a, that's a, that's a huge issue. And, and again, I think the really important point is the most expensive methods are also the most reliable. So the pill is less reliable because people don't use it consistently. Whereas an IUD, it's pretty hard not to use it consistently, similar to, to an implant. Uh, and there, there was a question in the chat about where we find information about the municipal uh, city level advocacy. Um, and I might just provide a, provide a little bit of background on this because it was kind of something that's evolved throughout the duration of our campaign. We started off as like an old school letter writing campaign, like a bunch of feminists gathered around a kitchen table writing letters. And, um, and I still love that kind of old school vibe that we've had, but we've tried a bunch of new different things. Um, and one of them was getting municipal endorsements. I, I just so happened to play ice hockey with the city councillor here in Victoria. And uh, our locker room is full of a bunch of progressive lefties. And such that last night's hockey game, we were all uh, had them all write letters because it was the uh, National Day of Remembrance and Action uh, for Violence Against Women. Um, and we were chatting. He said, well, I can just get ask the city of Victoria to endorse the policy. And they did. And since then, we just reached out to every municipality and a bunch of really good ones have stepped up. So for the city of Ottawa, um, I think what you want to do there is you probably want to reach out to a counselor um, and, and ask them if they have a process. Because some municipalities, depending on the size of the municipality, will have an easier or harder process. So for small towns, you send it to a counselor, they do a notice of motion and the next meeting, they talk about it, it's done and done. Um, Whereas for larger cities, they may have like a health committee or like, for example, here in Saanich, we have a healthy Saanich committee and I tried to work a policy through that committee. And then once it's adopted by the health committee, it goes to the, the general council. But every city is slightly different. And I, I don't know Ontario politics all that well. So I'd suggest finding a friendly counselor or any counselor and just ask them what process you'd follow. Um, and then the decision point you're going to, want, going to want to make is, is the city just asking the province to implement this policy? Or is the city doing the policy themselves? Some cities have given out free contraception because they recognize it's a huge benefit at the city level. Um, and, and so the, the policy works best at a provincial or national level because you know everyone deserves free contraception. Um, but at a city level, there's a lot a city can do. If your city does not have free condoms, uh, both internal and external condoms at all of their facilities, they bloody well should. Um, and, and they should also then have free menstrual products in all of the washrooms. That's not that expensive. Um, City of Saanich, for example, spent like $23,000 on toilet paper in its facilities last year. Okay, let's add tampons and pads. That's not going to be that much more money. And it's going to hugely benefit members of the public. And similarly, when I was a student union elected official at the University of Calgary, we used to buy condoms by the by the huge like garbage like a garbage bag full of condoms i think they bought them by the kilogram and you just buy bulk condoms and you have them out in jars for anyone who wants them so i'd recommend reaching out to the city of ottawa see what they're already doing and see where you can make improvements and sometimes it's as simple as let's put out a jar of condoms and sometimes it's let's actually see if we could do this at a city level that was a longer answer but i really love that kind of level of activism and one quick anecdote on that is um one of our municipalities 
uh, a bunch of women got together and asked them to endorse the policy and they didn't, they rejected our letter and there was a news story on it. And this upset enough people such that like 300 people formed a Facebook group in like three days and petitioned the city to revise, review their decision. And 300 people may not seem like a lot of folks, but it was about a quarter of the entire town. <laughs> um, and they did. And then that group talked to me and they're like, well, we got the city to endorse contraception. Well, we have all these people who are like super active now. What do we do? Yeah, they, they, their Facebook group suddenly went to become like the local water warriors and they were working on clean water in their trailer uh, park. So like, it's amazing just that level of we have a win um, and we can use that energy to, to do other amazing community activism. Um, and I'm going to defer to um, Emily or Marissa on that next question because there's acronyms, which I am, it may be late in the day, but I, I see LNG and I, I'm thinking about uh, a different issue, I think. I think this is at a referring to emergency contraception methods. Oh, thank you. Marissa, take it away, please. <laughs> uh, I'll actually defer to you because I don't actually know if we include this. I think she means, do we include, are we trying oh, to advocate for free emergency contraception methods? Perfect. Awesome. Okay, thank you. No, that, that makes more sense. Uh, LNG and UPA, what are, what are those though? Now I, I feel like I'm betraying my ignorance on acronym stuff. We'll have, anyways, we'll get some clarification in the chat, but no, so yeah. um, Brit uh, British Columbia already has free MIFI. So as of 2018, Mifprister and Mifcomizo, the abortion pill has been free, um, which is fantastic. I should note that, ah, thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you for clarifying the acronyms. Uh, we, I live in an alphabet soup sometimes and uh, it gets confusing. Um, so yeah, so we have like, for example, the abortion pill is free in British Columbia and it's been free since 2018. Um, what's really interesting to note is the cost of Mifpristin is about the same as like an IUD. And obviously that you've got, you know, a pill that deals with one unplanned pregnancy versus, uh, you know, a device or medication that, that prevents, uh, you know, an infinite potentially number of pregnancies. So it just makes sense to have that, that free as well. Um, I actually don't know about emergency contraception. I believe you can get it free in some clinics. Um, like, for example, uh, there's a lot of really well-stocked clinics in Vancouver. Um, Options for Sexual Health actually has free contraception for folks who really do need it. Um, and the issue is, of course, that those clinics are lovely clinics in Vancouver. Um, and so you have to then get to Vancouver, which is great if you live in the lower mainland, maybe not these days with the flooding. Um, but if you live in, say, Lumbee or 100 Mile House, that's not an option. So um, I can't speak directly to emergency contraception across the province, but I do know that, that there are definitely some places that you, you could probably find it for free as well if necessary. But that's also just another, actually, another point that's worth highlighting, which is this, this oh, and Emily, I think you want to jump in here, but oh, it's, I was it's, just, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Taylor. It, there's a trap of poverty too, right? So in a sense, like it's expensive to be poor has been a, a, this interesting statement that you often see brought up that seems a bit, bit counterintuitive at first, but it's things like, okay, there's a program there. Let's say there's a government program that does give you free contraception. If you go fill out some paperwork, if you're within a certain demographic or a specific group or a specific income, you have to know about that program. You have to take time to fill out the proper paperwork to get that program. And then you may have to wait to get reimbursed to get the, you know, the funding for your, for your item. Um, and that might be straightforward for someone who has time on their hands, knowledge of a system, the ability to access the system, and the ability to pay and get reimbursed. But that's not an option for many folks. And so you have these additional barriers or like taking time off work to get your prescription for your pill uh, filled every three months because you can't afford to get a six month, to get filled for six months, for example. So these things kind of add up and they particularly hit people who are, who are living in, in marginalized situations. And Emily, go ahead. Sorry, I was, uh, I was rambling about uh, side topics. No, I was just gonna say that like, um, I think emergency contraception is something that like the campaign believes in, but something that we don't actually explicitly name often in our advocacy. So I really appreciate that point. And I mean, copper IUDs are a form of emergency contraception um, for some folks. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate that comment because I, I think that that is um, something that we could um, take moving forward. And that's actually a really good point that Emily raises too. Yeah, the copper IUD is used as emergency contraception, especially for people of above a certain body mass index, I understand, because there's a, a there's a body size relationship with, with the emergency contraception, which I won't pretend to remember the numbers on. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a solution. And you, by the way, you can also get free IUDs after an abortion in British Columbia. So there's a government program that says once you've had an abortion, they will also give you an IUD at the same time. So there's all this kind of like complicated paperwork, a boolea base or like uh, just jumble of policies. And the, the solution, the better solution is just get rid of all these complicated policies and just make it free for everybody. Because as you've seen, it, it just benefits everyone. I'm also just looking up the, the free uh, emergency contraception now because you've 
got me wondering. It's yeah, it's so weird as you talk about it. Like I was Googling and it's like, yes, you can get a vasectomy for free in BC. You can get tubal ligation for free in BC. I don't think you can get them reverse necessarily, but at least those things are available. Um, yeah, the, our person commenting is in Ontario. So the situation there is always going to be a little bit different. So here's maybe the national question. Have you considered going after the federal government, going after the Minister of Health to say these should be in the Canada Health Act in terms of the accords that the federal government is telling every province, this is a minimum standard that we need across the country? Great question. I can jump in here, Marissa Emily, because I've been active in this. Yes, so we've we've participated in provincial and federal budget consultations for the past three years. And we haven't focused as much federally on the issue. We've written letters and we've offered to give presentations to their budget consultation process and done surveys, um, but we haven't pushed it as hard, mostly because um, it, it, the, the bigger you get, you have to have a higher capacity. We just don't have the capacity as a, as a small group. I mean, quite frankly, the campaign is run off my credit card. I get reimbursed from our PayPal account. Um, and we were like, last week we were perilously uh, on the edge of going into the red. Um, and, you know, and we, it only costs like 300 bucks a, a month to operate. So I, I think one of the things that's held us back from doing a lot of federal advocacy has been just capacity. Um, we also saw a much stronger opportunity to, to win here in British Columbia. Um, we had some friends that wanted to set up a campaign in Alberta about a year and a half ago, um, we sat down, we, we worked with them. And by the way, this also speaks to the question in the chat. Yes, we're happy to chat with you anytime. So we, we chatted with a lot of groups and we sat down with our friends in Alberta. They got together, they had a name picked out and then Jason Kenny happened. Um, and there's just been more important issues to deal with. And I'm not saying they're more important, but there are some very acute problems happening in Alberta um, that a lot of our amazing activist friends just got distracted with. Um, so similarly, at a, at, a, at a federal level, it just seemed like a much larger issue where you, there's too much energy getting to, um, dissipated. But that being said, like professional medical organizations have also um, stepped up at the um, at, at the at the federal level. So, for example, I'm just going to bring up my notes here because I have the um, the notes on this. Uh, one thing I noticed as, as a political scientist is we have a lot of amazing knowledge and our friends in the medical world, but they don't have the background in campaigning often. So um, it's, it's helpful to kind of have this lovely mix on our campaign of, of, of medical people who know what's going on and a couple of like political scientists and lawyers who can help write a press release. And <laughs> but so, for example, at the federal level, the Canadian Medical Association has endorsed free contraception. The Society for Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada has endorsed the policy. The Canadian Pediatric Society has endorsed the policy. Um, and at, at a federal level, the numbers kind of work. There was a 2015 study, and I can't remember if this was mentioned today, but the Canadian Association Medical Journal estimated that the cost of delivering universal contraception in Canada was $157 million, but it would save in direct medical costs uh, $320 million. Um, so the, the numbers have been run at the federal level, and obviously there would be provincial differences. And this is something that should be done. Um, but the approach that we've taken is we're just going to focus on British Columbia at the moment provide that kind of inspiration and then hope that we can take all the energy from our campaign and, and spread it across the country. And maybe I'll just speak to the, the question of um, around emergency contraception and, and stigma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question in the chat for folks listening at home was, was stigma around emergency contraception. Um, and there's tons of it. And same with around contraception as well. Um, we have dealt with every possible argument you can imagine on Twitter. Um, and they don't, folks don't argue with us anymore because we win all those arguments because we have all the research. But, you know, we've heard arguments that are like, oh, I don't want to pay for someone to have sex. And you're like, I mean, too bad. You're already paying for it. And B, like, no. Um, and and also, you know, grow up and learn how to be a human better. Um, but, you know, and, and one of my favorite questions, and you, um, our, our wonderful commentator in the chat mentioned they're doing, their, doing research on sexual and reproductive health. We've had a lot of people in our campaign do research on these topics. And one of them chatted with me the other day. She was doing her master's. And it's like, are there any bad argument or arguments? Like, what's the best argument you've had against your policy? And it's like, nothing. They're all deeply, like, drenched in misogyny and patriarchy. There's, there hasn't been a good argument against this policy um, that isn't just hateful. Um, but yeah, and, and, and in Ontario, what was interesting is there was free contraception for people within like a certain age, like young folks for a while. Um, and I think that's gone away or, or doesn't cover enough folks. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of work to be done. Ontario, I think what's going to have to happen is our, our friends out there, and it's a lot of amazing medical students, um, they're really laying the groundwork for a campaign. And then ultimately we need to change in government. Um, and then when it's slightly more friendly to, I don't know, saving money and health, improving health outcomes and promoting equity. 
Um, but I don't know if, if Marissa or Emily also wanted to speak to, to stigma a little bit, because I know it's, it's an issue that comes up a lot. And I'm sure you folks have a bit more direct experience with working with, with patients and at the coalface, as it were. I will mention one thing, uh, and then maybe Emily can take it away on the stigma. Uh, you quoted, I think, $320 million in savings in direct costs. Um, I think it's also important to note that that's costs like pregnancy care, delivery care, or abortion care, which are all covered by MSP. But that doesn't even include all of the sort of social assistance that would go into a lot of folks who couldn't afford contraception in the first place and um, are not necessarily in a place to support themselves through raising a child. And so all the social assistance that is covered by the government. Um, and so the major argument about not paying for people to have sex, like you, like Teal said, you're already paying for it um, because all of those other uh, things are covered under MSP. Um, and so the 320 million is like gross underestimate of what would actually be saved by the government of Canada for paying for this uh, process. I would just add that like a little anecdote um, in part of my training, I've had the privilege to work in a women's services clinic and assist with um, terminations of pregnancies. Um, and so have been there for conversations around um, kind of, oh, you can have contraception for free available. And um, that's like, a that can be a very um, intense time for folks. Um, and so sometimes having the conversation, oh, do you wanna get an IUD put in today? Um, there's a lot of stigma around having an abortion, um, a lot of questions and uncertainty around accessing contraception in that time. Um, so even though that um, is often touted as like a, um, a sign of how, um, like a, a, a something that's being done positively to make uh, contracept contraception accessible, there's still lots of barriers like in that interaction, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would second that as I've uh, done the same clinic as Emily, we are at the same site, um, going through the same rotations. Um, and I would agree that that, as much as there is research showing that um, being able to uh, access long acting reversible contraceptive, contraceptive at the time of abortion does reduce um, the future rate of abortion, it is often a really um, emotionally charged and stigmatized conversation that you're having. and. Uh, it is quite a restrictive rule, so it has to be at the same time for it to be free, and that's not often something that folks are really thinking about or willing to discuss at that time. Um, and so, it, it, there, it really should just be free for everybody. But it is quite a restrictive um, sort of rigmarole that they've put into place, um, and it's often not the most meaningful, the most beneficial for folks to be discussing that at the same appointment. Um, and so, and there is, yeah, like you said, a lot of stigma around abortion as well. And so they're, they're dealing with a lot emotionally to say, this is your one opportunity for a free contraception is right now. So you have to make a decision. Yeah. And Marissa, I think that that's such a good point. It, it's, it's right now. So it's, it's immediately after the pregnancy termination, you can't say, oh, I'll think about it and I'll come back next week. It's, it's now or never, um, which is not the way that we want folks to be making decisions about their bodies and their healthcare. Great. Well, maybe I'll just give it, you know, 30 more seconds to see if anyone else has a final question. We might just wrap up shortly. Uh, this was a great presentation, a great talk. It reminds me of, I think last year or the year before, a couple of years ago, we had uh, a presentation from the $10 a day childcare people who are running that campaign. And the arguments came down very similar, where it's one of those ones where when you study it, Every dollar you invest just has so many more obvious economic opportunities. And aside from all of the other, you know, social justice arguments and just equity arguments, it's like if you pay for someone to take care of children, you free up people to go to work. That makes the economy better. It pays for itself. Just do it. It gives people more options. It gives people more choice. And same kind of arguments apply here. These talks are frustrating, I imagine, because they're so obvious or they feel like they should be so obvious which is you know maybe why a lot of people didn't come out because they go yeah yeah of course i agree with that it's like it's still good to talk about so thank you for talking about it tonight and i'll you know I'll just maybe end with the, with the fun live more lively uh, story from the campaign trail right before covid hit we were we were tabling um and up at uvic and 
when you're tabling on campus and doing outreach on like reproductive justice, our table actually turned into more of like a, a, a session where people just shared their stories. They would come up with us and one woman walks up and she's like, oh, I quite literally just put this contraception, like she has like her like bag from the pharmacy on a credit card I can't afford. And we're like, wow, okay, well, you need to sign a letter. Um, but my favorite story, that, that was not a good story, but the, my favorite story there was um, our volunteer was giving out buttons and bringing people over to the table. And they they brought over this woman who was there and she was filling out a letter on her phone. And uh, and the volunteer says, hey, like your boyfriend should come over. He, you know, come over here, man. You, you sign up, sign up. He says, oh, no, no, no. Contraception is a women's issue. And the woman turns to her boyfriend and dumped him on the spot. <laughs> And it was this moment of like pure praxis. And it was just like, what? No, no, we're, we can't go out if you're going to support this. And it, it's one of my favorite moments of the campaign because it just indicated that, you know, we all have something to say um, in this campaign. I often find it a little awkward, you know, uh, being a cis dude uh, talking about this issue. Um, but it also allows me to kind of um, maneuver with some more other folks in the political realm that often maybe ignore some of the voices on our campaign. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you get some interesting stories and I'm really hoping that the most interesting story we get is, is a victory, um, hopefully with this upcoming budget. Uh, but yeah, the last thing I'd say is for folks who are interested in learning more, go to our website. We have a huge archive of all of our press releases. Um, and if you want to set up a campaign of your own in your jurisdiction, get in touch. We can, we will share all of our, our resources and our research and backgrounders. Um, and, and we're happy to, to, help you get your campaign off the ground um, and we also need all the help we can get because we uh, we're currently focused and, and the last thing i'll say actually um is one of the things that's been really effective with our campaign is we've been very much laser focused on one issue free universal prescription contraception um whilst recognizing there's other issues right there's other barriers there's other forms of contraception there's other major and huge issues in sexual and reproductive health that we we know we are aware of but it's been really straightforward to to focus on that one issue I mean, Ian was just saying, you know, we, we've talked to a lot of people. I think for me, the most frustrating thing is just I run out of ways of saying the same thing over and over again. You know, I send out the same press release and it's like, oh, gosh, I got, I got to rewrite this sentence. And, you know, it's saying contraception is it cost, it saves money for people and governments and improves health outcomes and it promotes equity. How can I say that a different way? Okay, I'll order them or something. <laughs> Um, and it's it's been it's been really interesting to work on a campaign that's focused on one very straightforward policy, um, and hopefully it will be successful very soon. Let's hope so. So thank you again, everyone. Visit accessbc.org. Did I get that right? Good. Uh, bchumanist.ca. Have a great evening. Uh, we'll do a member special event in two weeks, and you'll see a notice about that soon. So I hope to see you there.